several miles back over into Iraq right now. You see them light up the sky, and you can hear a rumble. It sounds like there'll be several more volleys. This has all been going on for about the last, uh, oh, I'd say about 15 minutes. Here comes, the, you can see a flash of light on the horizon. Here comes one. Jim Axelrod, at what are they shooting? Well, Dan, when we ask the military that, they will tell us unspecified targets. However, we are led to believe there are what they're referring to as OPs, observation points. In other words, trying to soften up uh, the, the uh, southern Iraq, uh, the, the, whatever military positions there may be, they just don't know for sure what the troop strength is of the Iraqi military in the south, how much has actually been pulled north to Baghdad. So what they're trying to do is soften up some of the observation posts that the Iraqi soldiers uh, have in, in uh, southern Iraq to determine who, if anyone, is actually uh, manning them. So when the assault comes from uh, the north of Kuwait into the south of Iraq, they'll have a much better sense of what kind of, uh, of opposition the United States military will be facing. So that's basically what these uh, rockets that are being launched and the pallet and howitzer artillery that we've seen earlier this evening, that's what's uh, the thinking behind these. Well, Jim, uh, yeah? and what are the chances that part of this is also uh, forced defense? In other words, one can imagine that across that border, there are certain Iraqis who are creeping and crawling, peeping and hiding, trying to pick out uh, U.S. targets, and some of this fire could or could it not be directed at uh, those kinds of operators saying, listen, we're not going to sit here in a squat position and, and let them uh, pick their targets and pound away at us. Dan, that's exactly what we heard from several uh, officers today at the uh, staging position where we were. They kept saying that it's the enemy, in this case Saddam Hussein, who gets 51% of the vote. In other words, what, is hap what happens in any kind of military conflict uh, is determined by the enemy. So in other words, the United States military commanders made a decision once those scuds were launched this afternoon to unleash the barrage. That's what in the part of the purpose anyway of what you're seeing right now is all about. It's answering not only what came uh, across earlier this afternoon, but in the event that there is anyone, uh, any Iraqi soldiers in a hostile position, in other words, not ready to capitulate or give up, they're not going to take any chances uh, again to soften up and shape the, uh, the area that the 3rd Infantry will move through at some point in what we assume to be the near future. Jim, as we look at uh, the artillery being fired and the flares and the rocketry, reminded that General Patton said in war the only sure defense is offense. And lest we forget the efficiency of offense depends on the warlike souls of those conducting it, which means those young men and women of the 3rd Army Infantry Division with whom you are right there on the border. Yes, Dan, and you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting. You have a tremendous number in the, in the private and specialist ranks. You're talking about 18, 19, 20, 21-year-old kids. And this is the first uh, taste of combat for so many of them. And I talked to an officer yesterday who said in his sort of pep talk, that age-old traditional rallying of the troops that each officer does uh, with his, the soldiers under his command, they address the fact that fear is not necessarily a bad thing as long as it does not break a soldier's focus. Acknowledging that if you're 18 or 19 and head into combat for the first time is part of the process of being able to be effective as a soldier. Dan? Jim Axelrod, live with the 3rd Infantry. Let's hold this up for a minute, uh, General Buck Hernan. What is this we're seeing? What kind of fire is, or can you tell? Uh, it probably just looks like uh looks like uh, artillery uh, fire coming from the ground. I can't tell. I think those were the tapes that uh, Jim was showing us earlier of the suppression that was going out from the MLRS and the, R and the what third is ID. That, the MLRS? The multiple launch uh, rocket system and uh, long range rocket system and the artillery that was used probably to take away the eyes of the enemy and also to destroy any of his artillery or missile systems that may be able to engage us. Black, you know that area of the world, you know the geography. What's down there along that Kuwaiti-Iraqi border? Uh, set aside whatever may be the military, it's 
just basically your average sand dune country, isn't it? It's, it's even flatter than sand dunes. But about the only depressions there are the little levees that are built up. The, the water table's quite high. So if you want to have a road or anything like that, you've got to sort of pile up some dirt to have a road there. There's some oil fields in that area. But basically, it's sort of a cross between a swamp and a, and a flat, sandy desert. We go to Washington, a United States senator, uh, bonafide certified war hero from the Vietnam War, Republican senator from Arizona, Senator John McCain. Senator, good to see you. Thank you, Dan. It's good to be with you. What are you thinking as you watch and hear what's happening with at least the early beginnings of this ground war and great historic but also dangerous undertaking by the people of the United States? Well, I think my emotions are that of most uh, Americans, pride, uh, concern, uh, deep and abiding respect and affection for the men and women that are doing the job. Um, we saw last night the incredible flexibility of our military capabilities. Uh, you know, Dan, even in 91, when only 10% of our weapons were precision guided, and now 90% the uh, ability to identify a target and then put massive firepower on it as we did is a remarkable technological uh, thing and the war that you and I spent a lot of time around uh, <laughs> there was no way you could accomplish something like that second of all obviously since the major battle has not been joined uh, still some apprehension but great hope from some of the signs we see and hear that perhaps the Iraqi resistance will be uh, not so strong Senator, this may not be the best time to talk about it, but looking far ahead, whenever the American invasion comes and whenever it's successful, uh, let us hope and pray, uh, however one may feel about the war, that once we're engaged, it is successful. Then comes the hard part of making the transition. Let's talk about that so the American public can be prepared for it. We probably should, and probably should have talked a lot more about it uh, before it began. Um, I'm an optimist, Dan. I'm a great believer in freedom and democracy and the miraculous things that the hope and aspirations uh, for it can achieve. I believe it will be American troops will be greeted as liberators. I believe, despite the different schisms within the country, uh, that we will see. Uh, with the help of many other nations, uh, the beginnings of a free and democratic society. It took our country a long, long time. Many would allege we're not there yet. Uh, and yet I'm confident that this will not only be a great benefit to the Iraqi people who have lived under the most terribly cruel, oppressive regime, but it also will send a message in the Middle East to the neighboring countries, and it will also send a message to some people in this country who I believe have condescendingly believed that somehow the people of the Middle East uh, don't have the same hopes and dreams and aspirations that all people, in my opinion, hold. Senator, what do we know about the cost of this? Uh, the administration, perhaps for understandable reasons, didn't want to talk about the cost, but last week there were estimates of maybe 80, 90, maybe 100 billion dollars. In your opinion, is that a lowball estimate or pretty much on the money? don't know because we don't know how long it lasts uh, but I've heard estimates from as low as 35 to 40 billion up as high as uh, as you said and then of course that's not the reconstruction cost this time we will be bearing the financial burden last time it was uh, borne by the Saudis and the Kuwaitis and others and I think that has to be taken it into calculations when we consider whether we have tax cuts uh, increased spending on other programs and we're going to have to make some very tough decisions and so far unfortunately we've avoided them both for good reason and not so good reason last question senator can we afford the war and another tax cut at the same time i i don't think that we should rule out a stimulus because i think we probably need it given the condition of the economy i just don't think we could do it now when we have no idea what the cost of the war is uh, or the post-war reconstruction. I think the appropriate time would be once we've figured that all out. But I'm not opposed to stimulus, but I don't understand how we would want to proceed with that at this moment. Senator John McCain, live from Capitol Hill, thank you for being with us. Thanks, Dan. We're going to uh, go 
first of all, let's show you a picture of live from Baghdad where things have quieted down, if we can get that picture up. Because in another pre-dawn attack, it has now been confirmed the U.S. used not only cruise missiles, but also the F-117 stealth uh, bomber aircraft to try to kill Saddam and senior Iraqi leaders, and also uh, specific targets uh, in Baghdad, including several ministries, some defense uh, installations, uh, on the outskirts of Baghdad, uh, some elite Republican uh, Guard units. In southern Iraq, U.S. forces have launched intense artillery barrages and uh, repeatedly, it's reported, have crossed into Iraq near the Iraq-Kuwait border. And we're going to take you now uh, to Scott Pelley, if we can. Again, we're trying one here uh, with our technology and also flying by wire, if you will, to see if we can get Scott Pelley up. Scott. Uh, describe for us the situation of the last half hour and then review for us quickly what's happened there along the border where you are. You seem to be at a nexus of uh, a considerable uh, firing and combat activity. Dan, the battle has been going on all around us, and it seems clear at this point, now that we've been able to watch this for a few hours, that at least part of what we're seeing is a cavalry and scout operation. This would be combined armor and attack helicopters probing the enemy's defenses, finding out where the enemy's observation posts are, and attacking those directly. One of those observation posts, <clears throat> excuse me, appears to be directly behind me. Iraq is right behind me. And we saw a, a number of attacks on this position earlier today. We have a little bit of videotape from earlier this evening. A number of helicopters scouted this area, and then we saw a barrage of artillery hit that place. Uh, it has been hit by helicopter rockets. It's been hit by artillery throughout the night. Uh, another helicopter flew by a short time ago, hovered over the same position, surveilled it, and flew away, and we haven't seen anything else from there since. But it is clear from the earmarks of what I just described, that a lot of what we've seen tonight has not been a massive armored invasion. Excuse me one second, Scott, while we cut away. This is CBS situation. News continuing coverage of America at War. And we're returning with our coverage, and we pick up again where we left off with Scott Pelley. Scott, I'm sorry to interrupt there, but I know you understand. And you were saying to us that there's been uh, sporadic and in some cases uh, fairly continuing artillery fire and helicopter attack across the border. Uh, and later information indicates that some, if not all of this, is designed uh, to spook what's on the other side, to keep them from spying too much, if you will, and targeting in U.S. forces. Exactly, Dan. As you know, Saddam can't fly his air force, and of course he doesn't have anything like a spy satellite. So he has no way of knowing what's on the battlefield unless his own scouts and his own border patrols are able to divine what the Americans and the British are doing in this position. I think tonight's operation has had a great deal to do with blinding Saddam and his forces and probing the defenses to see what would happen when we went in with our armor and with our helicopters. We've had a lot of that tonight. At the moment, it happens to be quiet, but we've had several hours of heavy artillery barrages. And in fact, right now, I can hear multiple launch rocket system rockets landing at another position not very far away from where we are now. Uh, I think we're going to be in for this kind of operation all night long, Dan. Scott Pelley live along the Kuwaiti-Iraqi border where there has been a lot of uh, helicopter attack, weaponry fired, and artillery fire. We're holding here for the moment because the White House said they would have uh, some uh, videotape of the, the president uh, speaking with some members of his staff. We don't have it yet, but we expect to have it uh, reasonably soon. Now, to recap, Turkey has given permission for overflights, not yet for ground troops in Turkey, but it would be a big help to, even to get overflights. Baghdad has been attacked again, a bigger attack than last night by a considerable margin. Several ministries hit. Uh, the Iraqis say Saddam Hussein's family home was hit, but said there are no casualties. Elite Republican Guard unit attacked around Baghdad by a combination of cruise Tomahawk missiles uh, and the F-117 stealth bomber. In the south, Marines, U.S. Army troops, and some British ground forces are operating just inside the Iraqi-Kuwait uh, border on the Iraqi side. 
Washington advises don't be misled uh, that this may very well not be the start of the major ground invasion. And so now we go to the White House and I believe videotape of an earlier appearance by President Bush. I've called my cabinet together to review uh, our strategies to make the world more peaceful, to make our country more secure, to make the lives of our citizens as, as healthy and as prosperous as possible. We heard from Secretary Rumsfeld, who briefed us on the early stages of the war. There's no question we've set the finest of our citizens in the harm's way. They perform with great skill and great bravery. We thank them. We thank their loved ones. We appreciate their sacrifice. We're from Secretary Powell, who briefed us on the ever-growing coalition of the willing nations who support our deep desire for peace and freedom. Over 40 nations now support our efforts. We are grateful for their determination. We appreciate their vision, and we welcome their support. As well, we discussed the need to make sure we have plans in place to encourage economic vitality and growth. We will continue to push for a Medicare system that is compassionate for our seniors. We care deeply about the fact that uh, some children in our society can't read. We want the best of education for every citizen in America. This cabinet is confident about the future of our country. We're confident we can achieve our objectives. I'm grateful for their service to their country. Thank you. President Bush, that was on videotape. He spoke just uh, a few minutes ago uh, in Washington as U.S. ground forces are operating at least to some degree just inside the border in southern Iraq and a uh, U.S. air attack has been completed apparently for the moment on Baghdad. This is a second day attack. You're watching and listening to CBS News continuous coverage of America at War. Stick in here with us. This CBS News special report is part of our continuing coverage of America at War. From CBS News headquarters in New York, here is Dan Rather.